those famous faces are just a few of the, the many people that our next guest has interviewed in the past year. In fact, it's been a year since celebrity interviewer Glenn Plaskin joined us, of course, a Buffalo native. And uh -huh. I'm looking at the list now. Audrey Hepburn, Joan Collins, Senator Bradley, Bryant Gumbel, Mary Tyler Moore. And then coming up tomorrow, in fact, you're going to be interviewing Peter Jennings. Mm. I, you know, all of a sudden, all of these interviews really seem to be taking off. What is it? Are we just, uh, the, it, does the public have an insatiable appetite for celebrities? It seems that way. Lucky for me. <laughs> yeah. What do you do when you go in? So many different types of people that you're going to interview. For instance, Peter Jennings tomorrow, you're going to interview him at lunch. What do you ask of Peter Jennings that hasn't already been asked? You know, I always think uh, interviewing someone at lunch is a disaster because you have to try to eat and think at the same time, which for me is very difficult. <laughs> so, uh, and it, it, the waiter keeps coming over and interrupting, mm. and, and you know they can be telling you about some deep dark thing that happened, and then all of a sudden, would you like some more bread? <laughs> and then you go home and you listen to the tape recording of the interview, and you hear all the glasses and the silverware <laughs> clinking, and it's no fun. Well, now you said it, uh, tape recorder down the middle of the table. Is that it? And then yeah, they just little, they forget about it. A little tape recorder, and then I what I do is before just the way I'm sure you do before interviewing somebody, I get a briefing book that the magazine sends me, and I read it. And I under and any question that interests me, I just write down. Mm -hmm. And I read all the other interviews that have been done. For instance, with Peter Jennings, it's a book this thick. And then put them in categories: personal, professional, you know, this and that. And I try to memorize as much as I can. And then I write them out on cards. And then I leave the cards. And what I what happens is you go home after the interview and you find that you've forgotten to ask about a quarter of the things. And so what I've been doing lately is I call them back the next day. And I say, can we talk another half hour? I find that that seems to be essential lately. Well, you've written for so many different magazines, uh, Us, Family Circle, Ladies Home Journal, uh, and even Penthouse and, and Playboy magazines. I wanted to ask you about Joan Collins. Uh, mm. What was she like? You just uh, you well, just did that interview. Well, I went to Europe, and I did uh, interview Joan Collins and Michael Caine in London, and I went to Switzerland to interview Audrey Hepburn. So that was a fun trip. And. Uh, in London at the Ritz Hotel, Joan Collins and I were having lunch. She likes to have lunch. And here's this Alexis Carrington coming, you know. So I was scared. There's this long 300 foot pink hallway, and they said she's going to make her entrance from down there, and there were people waiting. So I hid over here on the side. And then I saw this person come in with this white fedora hat and a white suit. It looks just like Alexis. And I said, oh, gee. So I stood over here, and then she, when she got near me, I came out of the hallway and I said, you must be. Joan. <laughs> and she said, oh, you must be Glenn. <laughs> and oh, she was very, and we sat down at the table, and I had told the maitre d', don't put her facing out to the room, because everybody will be looking at her, we won't be able to concentrate. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, Miss Collins always sits facing the room. So I said, all right. She goes to the table, he puts her over by facing the room, she says, I don't want to sit here. I don't want to face the room. So I was very happy. Was she that. nice? She was extremely nice and extremely intelligent. And this is a woman who's had four husbands. The first one raped her on their first date before they were married. Uh, the second one was, was unfaithful to her. Uh, the third one had a drug problem. And the fourth one, the most recent divorce to Peter Holm, he, he hit her and, and, and abused her and, and was very opportunistic in terms of taking her money. So she's really been through the whole mill of... How do you establish, though, that special contact? Because a woman like Joan Collins has been interviewed by everyone, and of course you're hoping to get something that's a little bit different and a little bit new. Well, I find that if you meet somebody just as in real life, uh, they either like you or they don't, and vice versa. So if they don't like you, I think it's just not going to be as good. I just liked her, and I think she liked me. Uh, I'm trying to think of someone who I didn't get along with so well. Remember Cagney and Lacey, Tyne Daly? Right. No rapport. It was a lousy interview. Uh, Mary Tyler Moore and I, uh, when I met her at her apartment, I liked her very much. Betty White, when she answered the door, it was just like the Golden Girls house. This very informal, nice house. She opens the door and her dogs come out and the mailman is handing her her own mail and she couldn't have been nicer. And within 10 minutes she's telling me about how Alan Ludden had died, you know, her husband Alan Ludden, of cancer and she started to cry as sometimes you find during interviews that even though people don't know you, you're asking them about things that are so personal that, that within mm -hmm. 20 minutes they will, th their emotions are out of proportion to the length of time you've known them. How about Bryant Gumball? Because you, this interview in particular, I mean, we were talking about this before the show, I saw excerpts from this interview all over the place in every newspaper around the country because he said some not too complimentary things about his uh, co-workers that I would think got him into a lot of hot water. I mean, d d didn't he realize that he's I talking to someone that that's going to publish that? I, I'm sure he did, and I was told that for two days after the interview came out, he didn't leave his trailer. 
he, he was, I think, pre-Olympic preparation. That was in Us magazine, right? Yeah. It always makes me feel funny, though, if somebody reads what they said and then doesn't like it somehow. I mean, they said it, and somehow it's the interviewer's fault. Do you know what I mean? I mean, he was saying that Cher does nothing but promote herself, and Joan Collins wouldn't do anything if it wasn't in her own best interests, and Willard talks too much, and he was saying just, they weren't that horrible things. It's things that we would all say about people we know, but when the tape recorder's rolling, you have to be more careful, I think. What was Audrey Hepburn like? What, the truth or that? Yes, the truth. <laughs> <laughs> of course the truth. How shall I make you know, it up? lie to us. <laughs> well, everybody loves Audrey Hepburn, so I have to say that everybody loves her, so I don't want to wreck your, your feelings about this. I personally was not as thrilled with her as I might have been. Is I, that a polite way of saying? You? <laughs> no, I just wasn't as thrilled because we had lunch in a very beautiful hotel called the Beau Rivage overlooking Lake Geneva, and I, we went to great trouble to arrange this lunch, and there was something about her that was very... Um, distant and a little patronizing maybe. I, at one point I was asking her about her experiences during the war because she's traveling now for UNICEF raising money and, and she herself uh, <clears throat> suffered during the war f from malnutrition. And she said, well of course you wouldn't understand this, you weren't alive then. And I find occasionally uh, not that I'm very young anymore, I'm pretty old, but occasionally you know somebody who's older during an interview will sort of patronize you and it's sort of uncomfortable because the interviewer, of course, is the one who's in charge, not the, not the subject. D do people come to you after it's written, though, I mean, and get really angry or, you know, say, gee, well, I liked you? Or, I mean, do you, do you ever become friends with the people you interview? Mm. I'm not really. I'm very boring. I don't make <laughs> celebrity friends. People say, oh, you must go to so many parties. No, I don't do. And I watch TV. I go out with my friends for dinner. I, I go swimming every day. I, I, I made friends with a dog in my building, and I give the dog a bath. It's just very glamorous, let me tell you. I even wrote an article called Puppy Love that's coming out based on an experience that I had I, w I wanted a puppy desperately, so one day I impulsively bought this little baby puppy, eight weeks old, and I took it home, and I couldn't sleep all night. I thought, oh, my God, what did I do? Fifteen-year commitment, and the puppy was in the bathroom, of course, doing what puppies do, <laughs> and they assured me that no self-respecting puppy would do it in its own bed. This one did. <laughs> And the next morning, I took him back, and the puppy was $950. And I almost shot myself the next day. They wouldn't give me all my money back. Oh, no. So as punishment to myself, I wrote an article to pay for the puppy I returned. <laughs> and about my experiences and about all the things that you better know if you're going to have a puppy. Is it going to be published? And it's being published in the December issue of a magazine called MGF, which is a men's grooming and fashion. I've got to ask you, though, some of your articles <laughs> that are published in Playboy, and particularly the one in, in Penthouse on Senator Bradley, for us to find it, we had to leaf through some rather... Uh, Pretty pictures. Uh, unusual positions. I mean, do you, do you just not think about it once they're published? Uh, do you rush the newsstand to see where it's positioned in the, in the magazine? Well, people like naked bodies, I guess, and, and they also like good interviews, so why not, I mean, Hugh Hefner has always said, why can't, um, you know, there's a difference of opinion. Some people think that women are being abused and opportunized on, and others don't. Uh, if people don't want to read that magazine, they don't have to buy it. All right, got a call here. Good morning. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I wanted to know um, how uh, Glenn Plaskin's grandmother is. Oh, <laughs> my grandmother said, don't mention me. Uh, I didn't do Essie, it. Essie, Essie, oh, that's I right. I wanted to say that I saw her on TV making her uh, crummy cookies. <laughs> and we should point so out, when she says crummy cookies, that's what she calls them. They're like crumbly cookies. In fact, right? my grandmother made some cookies for tomorrow's interview with Peter Jennings and for somebody else, too. So she's doing fine. She has much more energy than I do. Do you have a favorite, someone that you've interviewed that is like your absolute favorite? I think Katherine Hepburn, who we've talked about here many times, is probably one of my favorites. Anybody that you want to interview that you haven't? Well, I'm going to California in two weeks to interview Amy Irving and Clint Eastwood, and I think they're both good. I do want to interview Barbara Streisand, and we, uh, the New York Times recently gave me an assignment to interview her, and I thought, well, maybe she, she doesn't do interviews, but maybe she would do it for that, you know? And she said no. <laughs> she said no. So I'm not infallible. Ah, Glenn, a delight to have you with us. Nice Don't wait so again. long to come back. Thank you. Nice to see you too. You too. We'll be back. Stay with us. Bye.